My name is Monk Rowe, and we are in Los Angeles filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Bob Magnuson with me after a burning set oh, at the International Jazz Party. And I have a feeling when you work with Roger, it's always an adventure. Always. With That's Roger Kellaway, I should tell my, my film audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love working with Roger Kellaway and John Guerin. We've been trying to do something as a trio. It's kind of hard to get anybody to, you know, we, we, uh, we've made a CD, but we haven't been able to get anybody to buy it. But mm -hmm. Roger does, uh, he's such a versatile musician. I mean, he's done film writing and uh, composed concertos for orchestras and, uh, uh, you know, you name it and he's done it. And then he's, he's this, uh, has this terrific spirit of uh, adventure when he plays, like you were bringing out. And so, uh, I really have to pay attention. To, it can go any place at any time with Roger. There's no coasting. Yeah, and, and it does. So I have to really stay awake. You know, you you mentioned something that I've I've been hearing lately, and that is that it's hard to have a, a cohesive group of musicians that yeah. you know that you can get an ensemble sound and some rehearsed stuff. That's yeah. a real shame. It is, and it's happened more in the last 10, 15 years that uh, I guess the cost of flying has gotten more and more expensive and because mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's several people that I work with that, you know, say, well, we'd love to take the group, but they end up having to go themselves and then pick up musicians. They get very fine musicians generally, mm -hmm. but there's still something different when you just thrust together with somebody as to... Uh, when you get to work and play together some and get a real group ensemble mm -hmm. sound happening. Yeah. Yeah. But it just seems to be kind of uh, prevalent now nowadays. It's rare to see somebody take a whole quartet or a quintet and right. travel with them. Now you started out in the French horns. Yes, I did. I was, both my parents are classical musicians. Uh -huh. My dad was a Juilliard graduate, I studied clarinet. And I grew up in San Diego. I was born in New York City mm -hmm. when, while he was attending Juilliard. Uh, came to San Diego. I'm almost a native at probably age three or something oh. like that. And uh, studied the horn for 12 years. Wanted to play in an orchestra like my dad. That was my ambition. Uh, loved the classical guitar. Somehow I got this great interest in classical guitar. My dad took me to hear Segovia. I just, you know, flipped out as a kid. So he let me take classical guitar lessons as a sort of fun sideline things while still studying the horn and playing in youth orchestras. And I have a brother four years older who had studied clarinet with my dad and he got in the local rock band in San Diego. We lived by the beach, kind of beach surf rock and roll. Oh yeah. And they needed an electric bass player. So he says, well, my kid brother's gonna, he'll do it. He plays the guitar. So he t says to me, you know, it's the same as the, your guitar, oh. bottom four strings and octave. So that's how I started playing. Based. You know, it was electric bass, playing in rock bands, and then, and you know, just kind of a fun thing. Beach is, Boys stuff. Yeah, and Beach that. Boys and Dick Dale and the Dale Tones. All right. <laughs> some really awful music for the most part. But I was having a lot of fun and making some money on the weekends uh -huh. playing dances. And then this band leader of a very good rhythm and blues band in San Diego, George Semper was his name. Somehow he asked me to join his band, which was miles above my abilities, you know, mm -hmm. and I loved it, and uh, and they seemed to think I was going to do okay, and uh, I started, because it was very syncopated, and I had been playing this very straight up and down kind of music, and they were playing Bobby Blue Bland, and Ike and Tina Turner, and James Brown, you know, music, and it was wonderful, and then they, they were the ones that really kind of turned me on to some jazz. I was listening first to uh, Jimmy Smith, and some kind of R&B-ish jazz, you know, good, funky jazz. And somebody gave me the Kind of Blue record by Miles Davis, mm -hmm. and that was it. It just sort of blew my mind. And I was 19, and I said, that's it, and I, and I wanted to play jazz. And I thought about guitar, and I thought about the bass, and I thought about the French horn. I'm not the, I listened to some French horn players, and I didn't care for the French horn in jazz. Yeah. I like it in arrangements, but I don't like it as There was a very few guys. Um, John Gross, maybe, if you remember, he was playing, yeah. and Dwight Key Mitchell. D right, the Willie, what was it, Willie, Willie Ruff? Ruff and, yeah, Ruff Mitchell. Mitchell Ruff. I listened to some of those to get an idea, mm -hmm. and, 
it, it's almost too regal of an instrument or something. <laughs> yeah. And I thought about Trump, but anyways, I gravitated to the bass, just being naive and thinking that it was like the electric <laughs> bass, and little did I know. And so that was the direct, and that was it. And I yeah. never looked back. And what was your father's opinion of? of you moving away from the classical? Both my mother and father thought, you know how kids grow up and you, you get into this fad or phase and then you move over here. And, and so they were very uh, wise and didn't say much to me, but they told me later, they thought to themselves, well, Bob's on another phase, you know, <laughs> he's doing this. And what actually happened was I I had been playing probably about a year or something. I practiced tons, you know, just, I was practically a recluse. I worked in a cabinet shop days and I would just come home and practice the bass, mm -hmm. you know, all hours of the night and all weekends and play, you know. And uh, the, the conductor of the San Diego Symphony heard me playing on a jazz program. It was the Joe Masters Jazz Mass, if you're familiar with that. It's got some singing and uh, of jazz on some, and I played some arco parts, you know. And he sent a guy up to me after the concert and hired me Oof. for the orchestra. Would I like to play in the symphony? So I said, I'd love it, you know. So I was the last bass, eight bass players, last one on the line. And that's when my parents, thought, you know, when I told them, they just like flipped out, you know. Bob's in this was this, the San Diego Symphony? San Diego Symphony. And this was the when your father was in too, or? He had sort of semi-retired and see. was, but we did get to play a little together in the orchestra. That's wild. Yeah, it was a wild story. Yeah. And, uh, and then later, oh, I did that for a season, and then I moved to Las Vegas. I had met some guys, mm -hmm. played a couple show bands, and through there I got the Buddy Rich Band job. Did you, were you playing electric at the same time? Yes, doing both? At, the, at that point I was playing both. You and know. within a year, let me see if I'm doing this math right. Yeah. You started bass when you were 20? 19. 19. Yep. And within a year or so, you were working with Buddy Rich? Well, probably about two years. Two years. Yeah. Was way over my head. Again, way over my head. Mm -hmm. I mean, most, I've been just very uh, kind of blessed to, to be in the right place at the right time or something yeah. because. Uh, you know, and I I had heard of Buddy Rich, but I didn't know. You know, I was just this naive kid. You know, yeah, I want to play with Buddy Rich. So, <laughs> so little did I know. And he didn't say a word for about four four nights, maybe. And I could read anything they had in the book. Yeah. I could read anything. Didn't know any songs. Didn't know much about anything. But I could read. You know, whatever they put, because I had read music all yeah. my life. And. Uh, so after about three or four nights, all of a sudden, Buddy starts yelling at me, you know, cursing. <laughs> While we're playing, up on the stand, you know, in front of all these people. And I would get more and more frightened. And the more he yelled, the worse I played, you uh -huh. know. I just was like, and finally I was at my wits end. We were in Copenhagen. Joe was, Azarello, who you mentioned, was still on the band. I went in. I was just a wreck. And I said, Buddy, you know, uh, thanks. I'm just not making it, you know. And, you know, was trying to kind of give my notice, you know, you know, you'd be better off with somebody much more experienced mm -hmm. than I am. And he came up and put his arm on my shoulder and, you know, he says, he says, that's all right, kid. Anytime you want to play in this band, you call me. I was like, what? You know, he's been yelling at me every night, you know, cursing. Yeah. I was like, I couldn't understand. Then I sort of kind of relaxed at that point because, uh, -huh. uh I'd given notice, and not, you know, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't caring as much. And I thought, I just, so I kind of relaxed. I started to do a better job, and I never left. I stayed a year mm -hmm. playing with the band, and mm -hmm. he never said, "You gave your notice, you better get out of here." Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of, a, I mean, he was, he was good to me, and it was a love-hate thing for me, kind of, with oh. him, you know. And he taught me a lot. He made me aware, really aware of the importance of playing good, solid time, you know. Up to that point, I was having a good time, but I don't think I was playing any good there time. There you go. That's good <laughs> advice right there. Make sure you're playing it if you're having it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I look back at him with, uh, you know, some love and some hate, too. Yeah, you know? and uh, I'm sure you're not the first person to yeah. say that either. <laughs> but he did teach me some really good things. And I met all kinds of great people, you know, the LaBarbras, Joe and Pat LaBarbra and Don Menza and... 
Joe Romano and uh, Art Pepper was on the band and Al Porcino. I yeah. roomed with Al Porcino. Which albums um, did I play? Yeah, I only did one record. It was kind of an awful record. It was called Buddy and Soul. It was sort of Buddy's attempt at rock and roll. Uh -huh. uh, I think almost most of the tracks I ended up playing electric bass. Yeah. I think two or three I played string bass. But it was my first sort of big right. kind of project to get to do. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that band certainly was a, a big hit with uh, the college musicians too. I yes. mean I remember listening to the wearing those records out with yeah. my roommates. Oh yeah. And and then getting the charts and, and trying to play them. Yeah, he had some great bands and yeah. he was a real you know, he ran it like military, like a marine or something. It was a real taskmaster, but he demanded that it be tight and, you know, really sound good. Mm -hmm. I remember once he got us aside and he, he was really mad and yelling at us all, you know, and he says, you, and he called us all kinds of names, and, uh -huh. you just play loud, and I'll do the shading. <laughs> That's what he told us. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I thought, how can we just play loud, and he does the shading? <laughs> oh, man. But it was great. Uh, so you returned, did, uh, you returned to San Diego. Was that always your home base after Vegas? Uh, let's you see. Move around some? I got that job living in, no, I went back to Las Vegas at that point. Uh, had a little jazz gig in town, like an after hours thing. Started one or two in the morning and went till five or something. And I was playing the Viva La Girl show before that. So I was playing my regular, uh, it was in the lounge at the D old Dunes Hotel, and then I'd run down and play this jazz gig all night. Uh, and Gus Mancuso, who's a wonderful musician, has lived in Vegas for many years, plays all kinds of instruments, one of those guys, recommended me to Sarah Vaughn. And I was scared to death. And it was, oh. Jim, it was Jimmy Cobb playing drums, who was the drummer was on, on the, the record. Of, yeah, he was go. on the record. You know, here's one of my heroes. I was so nervous, and Jan Hammer was the pianist oh, at the time yeah. when I joined. And uh, this is 71, 72 or 71, 1, right? Yeah, was it 71? Around in there. I'm just trying to think of 71, how that fits in with the, he was the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Well, he left from Sarah probably after I had been there four or five months. Okay. And went right to the Mahavishnu Orchestra. That's right. when he left Sarah. And then we had Jimmy Rolls for kind of a hot minute, and then uh, Bill Mays in New York. Uh, he was living out here at that time in L.A. He came on just for a brief time. And then Carl Schroeder had just left uh, Roy Haynes band, and he joined. And Carl stayed many years, eight or nine years with Sarah. So that was the tr most, of, most of the trio I worked with was Jimmy Cobb he, and Carl. He was mm -hmm. there the whole time I was there. But it was one of the great experiences musically in my life to get to work with her, you know. I would like to do it now. I might do her some justice. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and again, it was the same thing. I was in way over my head. Uh, she seemed to like me and think I had some potential. And she was going to give me time to let it nurture it and bring it along, you know. Uh, but it was an w absolutely wonderful experience. Wow. You had said previously that you didn't know any tunes, yes. like when you went with Buddy. Yeah. Had you worked up your rep repertory some? By the time I played with Sarah, yeah, yeah I was starting. I mean, uh, I, I've never been what I'd call a tune smith, uh -huh. but uh, you know, I was trying to learn tunes and build up repertoire, and and like playing that jazz gig after hours. And if I didn't have a jazz gig, I would be out at uh, guys' houses. You know, we, some guys, Joe Murillo. He's also an upstate yep. uh, from Niagara Falls. He and Tony Murillo, they were friends I had there mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. We would play any hour. Sometimes it was just him and I, tenor sax and bass. We would play, you know, well, here's how this tune goes, you know. Because it's such a learning. I mean, still at this point, I'm still learning stuff, you know. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a lifelong learning venture, as you know, being a musician yourself. And wow. So I was, yeah, trying to build some repertoire and learn some things. Was Sarah a nice boss? She was a wonderful boss. You know, she had the nickname Sassy, and she could be. Uh -huh. And I saw her do it in the three years that I worked for her. But uh, never, ever with any of us musicians, with club owners that would try to give her a hard time or, 
you know, management, that kind of thing. Yeah. I would see her go off on them. But she loved the musicians, and, and she did some absolutely wonderful things. I had uh, my wife Janet and I had a, let's see, we just had our son at that time. We, not, we have a son and three daughters, mm -hmm. and at the time we just had her. And we were in New York. We just finished working at the Rainbow Grill, and uh, I think we'd been there two or three weeks, and we had about three or four days off. And then we were going to the Fairmont Hotel in Dallas to work for another two or three. And Sarah, one night we were hanging out, and she says, are you going to hang in New York with Jan or whoever, you know, some friends I had? I said, no, I'm going home to see my wife and son. And so, and she wasn't obligated for that short of a time to fly me anywhere but from New York to Dallas. And then after that, oh, Marshall Fisher, who she was living with, she said, Marshall, get Bob a ticket to San Diego. So she hmm. bought my ticket from New York back, and she says, get, you, you know, get yourself wow. to Dallas for the... So by the time I did all the flying, I had about a day and a half to <laughs> see the family. I get back to Dallas. Sarah says, did you have a good time? I says, yeah, just you know, too short. I, I miss Janet. And she says, would you like her and Matthew to come to Dallas? I says, I would love it. She says, Marshall, buy Matthew and Janet plane ticket. Gee. She bought round trip out of her pocket, you know, just... She did wonderful. When and she wanted me to come to L.A., we had no savings, you know. And uh, this was in '75 when I rejoined. I had a son and a daughter now, and my wife was pregnant with our second daughter, third child. And uh, Sarah had called me and, to see if I wanted to rejoin. I says, "Yeah, I'd be. I really would. It was right at a good time that I w really wanted to come back." And. Uh, she loaned us the money out front to get us up to L.A., pay, you know, first and last rent and all that. I mean, mm. I have nothing but wow. love and compassion. A real special place in my uh -huh. heart for her, wow. I mean. And then her singing was amazing. I mean, she was uh, great every night and then fantastic on other nights. I mean, the consistency level was just amazing to me. And Jimmy Cobb also, I mean, that was like, between the two of them, it was like going to graduate school or something mm -hmm. for me. And I approached it like that. I said, you know, I realized I was lucky enough to be there with these people, you know, take advantage of it, learn as much as you can, you know. I thought, if I can get my groove with him, you know, <laughs> it'll be in the right place. So, And he was just a sweetheart to me. I mean, he is just a lovely, lovely man. I love oh. him dearly to this day. From Buddy Rich to Jimmy Cobb. Yep. <laughs> Opposite ends of the spectrum, yeah. you know. Two, That's terrific. Two of the great drummers. You seem to be the guy on call in uh, San Diego for the jazz uh, films they do. Yes, yes. The, those uh, club dates club are called dates. PBS. Yeah. I'm actually doing one next Saturday with uh, Bucky Pizzarelli. Mm -hmm. Doing one with Bucky, so that'll be fun. Yeah, uh, yeah it's been a real nice series. Uh, we actually had a jazz club back some years ago called Alarios, and they brought in Hank Jones and uh, Kenny Barron and Benny Golson and Kenny Burrell and on and on and on. And I was working with almost all of them. A lot of them I knew and had worked with before, you know, some of the people, Art Pepper and some of the guys I had worked with uh, at other times in living, when I lived in L.A. I was in L.A. from 75 to 83. And then at that point went back to San Diego to, to have a nice place for my family. That was yeah. our impetus to go there. We wanted a good family environment. And L.A. wasn't the place, you know, mm -hmm. and I had four kids at that point and I thought, you know, well, I've gotten to do my thing, now I better do something for these people. Uh -huh. So, and it's been a good thing, and you know, it's a small jazz community, but there's some wonderful musicians so. living and playing there, and uh, I've been very happy uh, living, and uh, uh, about 90% of what I do is jazz playing, so I mm -hmm. feel pretty lucky. Were your kids uh, aware of what you did for a living, and did they think it was out of the ordinary? No, I don't think so, you know, and my wife was a very, she was always, uh, and is very, uh, you know, you know, the trash has to go out and uh, <laughs> the bed isn't made here and the kids need this and yeah. so it kept me a real, you know, in the real dad thing, which I'm really grateful uh -huh. for to her, you know. Um, 
I know with my mother and dad, my dad, playing in an orchestra is a huge amount of pressure, principal clarinetist, and, and she kind of uh, was very protective of him from us. You know, oh, now don't upset your dad, he's got to play tonight, and oh. you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and some of that is good, and there's times when, yeah, you, you appreciate it, but it, it also, I mean, my dad and I talk as adults, and he says, you know, if I had it to do over with, I'd have spent more time uh -huh. making contact with you. Yeah. So, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm a real homebody and a real mm -hmm. family guy, and now we have two little grandsons, and uh, it's, I'm just having a ball. It wow. just gets to be more and more fun. You know, I have two girls still at home, but uh, uh, both my oldest daughter and son are married, and oh. each have a little boy. So. Cool. Yeah, mentioning being a principal, anything in a yeah. symphony, that's a, such a totally different kind of pressure. It is. It's like it's a every different. note yep. has to be so. There's, I don't, the, the idea of a mistake is so right. small. Yeah, we can make a mistake in jazz and move it into something, you know, <laughs> or, you know but uh, they don't have that luxury there. You know, it's a different kind of pressure and I've done some orchestra playing on the French horn and on the double bass so mm. I, I've had a, you know and grew up around it and and my dad was marvelous at it I mean he really did a wonderful a wonderful job and exposed me to all kinds of uh, you know great music Shostakovich and uh, all the traditional people Mozart and you know Brahms and then I heard all the woodwind quintet literature they would rehearse in our house I remember going to sleep at night They'd be upstairs. I'd hear the woodwind quintet, you know, <laughs> as a kid, foray and uh, you know, just uh, Taffanel and all kinds of wonderful wow. composers. You know, so it was a great upbringing. Of the recordings you've done, are there any that stick out in your mind as being, you know, your best work? Yeah, it always seems like as as you do more recent stuff, that always seems better because you keep evolving and uh -huh. growing and. Uh, uh, we just recently did a record for Fresh Sound, which is uh, from Barcelona, I think, f uh, with Bud Schenck. It's Mike Wofford playing piano mm -hmm. and Joe LaBarbera, myself and Bud. And we did all music associated with uh, Bill Evans. And uh, it was really a fun project. Uh, I was happy with that. It was one of those dates we went in the studio and it just felt like we were playing live someplace, you know, which is kind of hard to get and rare, mm -hmm. but it does happen on some occasions. With rec And the sound was good and the music went good. So that was a lot of fun. And I just did some duo things with uh, Sue Rainey, also for the same label. It was Dick Shreve, piano, and myself. A lot of us just solo with uh, Dick and Sue together, and then they put bass on maybe six or seven tracks. That mm -hmm. I really... Enjoy. So it always seems like the more recent stuff I get to do is better because I'm playing at a at another place. And yeah. When I hear old stuff, I kind of cringe. And <laughs> <laughs> when you're, <laughs> do your kids listen to your music? They do now. You know, uh -huh. they're they're all adult. My uh, youngest daughter will be 18 in March, so they're young adults. You know, and uh, they've really come to enjoy music and. Uh, and they like jazz, which mm -hmm. I'm amazed, you know. And they have tastes of things that they like. None of them are listening to heavy metal, thank goodness. But uh, <laughs> but they're listening to, uh, and they've turned me on to some people. Uh, oh, what's this girl's name? Sarah McLaughlin. Sarah McLaughlin. I yeah. like her very much. You know, some people, I like a lot of R&B and some good pop. And, you know, I'm not a jazz snob. I, I mean, I have yeah. stuff I like. So. They've turned me on to some really mm -hmm. nice stuff. I'll hear some. I said, "What is that?" You know, and they, oh, it's so and so, and so I've heard some yeah. good, good things. When they brought them. their 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 friends home from junior high school, I mean, you didn't sit them down and say, "Here's my latest album." Do you want no, to play no, for your kids? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't no. score any points that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. You also played with um, John Clemmer. Oh yeah. What what happened to John Clemmer? I haven't. You know, I saw Oscar Castro Nevis just fri Friday night, and because we, we hadn't seen each other in quite a while, and we worked together on that. And I was asking him because I heard a new, I heard a record on the oh. radio of Oscar and John together. This was just like six months ago. So I asked Oscar. I says, "Did you just do a?" He says, "No, that's from 20 years ago." Oh. He said, "But somebody, JVC or somebody, just uh -huh. 
just put it out. So he hasn't seen, you know, he says once in a while John calls him or something. He's kind of a recluse. I, 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 I think he's still living in L.A. But none of the guys that I see that we work together with him ever see him. or hmm. So I don't know what's happened to him. He certainly hmm. had, was big there for a while. Yeah, you know? he was doing the echo. The echo, yeah, thing yeah I mean, stuff. he was the Kenny G before Kenny yeah. G. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Joe Farrell. Oh, a that great was, list of yeah, that was what great. A, what a great player he was. Yeah, man. I loved Joe and and playing in his. It was Victor Feldman and uh, John Guerin did it also uh -huh. on drums. We played quartet and then uh, who else? Oh, Russell Ferrante did it some from the Yellow Jackets. Mm -hmm. Russell, he played piano with us some, and uh, oh, Peter Erskine I think did it also with us and. It was great fun. We did a few little tours, and I got to do some recording with Joe. And, and the first record I made as a leader, I asked Joe would he participate, and he was kind enough to agree to do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I loved him. Just was a sweet guy, yeah. dear, dear guy. Really. What was this uh, Road Work Ahead? Road Work Ahead was, that's a funny story, because the record I just mentioned that I did with Joe Farrell, mm -hmm. I had Bill Mays, who I had been friends with for years, knew him from San Diego, played piano. John Guerin played drums. We have a wonderful drummer and percussionist in San Diego, Jim Plank. He played percussion on it. And uh, Albert Marks, if you remember Albert Marks, he had Discovery Records and Trend Records. Uh -huh. and he was the uh, producer of this record I did. Well, the record came out, and they were playing it on the local jazz station here in L.A., and there was a club called Dante's. Uh, Carrie Leverett was the owner at, at that time, and Carrie phoned me, and I used to work there a lot with Frank Rossellino and Joe DiOrio and all kinds of different people, and Carrie called me and says, Hey, Bob, I, I want your record's getting played. I, I want you to bring your group in here. I says, I don't have a group. I said, <laughs> you know, he said, well, you, what about your record? I says, well, you know, he says, well, like call some of those guys. And, you know, he sort of, I'll put you in here for a weekend, you know. So that's how this band came about. So I got Bill and Peter Sprague. Are you familiar with Peter no. Sprague? He's a wonderful guitarist from San Diego, played with uh, Charles McPherson and a lot of different great people. Uh, Peter was in San Diego, wonderful young, and Jim Plank. So I, we put that group together, and uh, we called it the Bob Magnuson Quartet, and we started yeah. playing, and we were all having such a great time together with the group, and everybody was kind of writing and contributing music, and Bill was making arrangements. Bill's a prolific writer and wonderful, and Peter is too. And uh, Peter would get his jobs in San Diego, and we'd call it the Peter Sprague Quartet, and hey. Bill would get a job, we'd call it the Bill Mays Quartet. Finally, we got together and had dinner or something. We said, let's put a collective uh, thing. And somehow we picked that from the sign. We says, well, we can get Caltrans to give us free advertising <laughs> if we use the name Road Work Ahead. You know? <laughs> so, so that's how the name came about. Uh -huh. And one of, my, I had, one of the records I did as leader, we called, it was the Bob Magnuson Quartet. Road Work Ahead was the name of the record and they okay. took a picture of me sitting by a Caltrans sign you know so we decided well let's use that so then we did a group record called Road Work Ahead and we worked a lot under mm -hmm. that and uh, I think it lasted two or three years something like that and we were having a ball and then Bill decided to move to New York and we thought about getting another pianist and but it was somehow it was the combination of the four guys that made the group what it was for us, so mm -hmm. we all just went. We, we still, Peter and I played a lot, and Jim and I played a lot in different contexts, but we never did that particular thing. And once in a while, Bill will come out from uh, New York, and we'll do a little, get a gig somewhere, and put it together and play mm -hmm. as a as a quartet, you know, oh. a reu road work ahead reunion. Uh -huh. So it's great fun once in a while, but it had such a special place mm -hmm. to all of us. We thought it just won't be the same without yeah without Bill. Have you ever had to work a, a non-music job, just out of? Yeah, I did. You know, as a young person, I uh, I worked in a cabinet shop, like I think I mentioned yeah. earlier. Uh, I was an apprentice to the uh, furniture finishers, which is mostly hand sanding. <laughs> did tons of that, some stripping. I got to do very little finishing, or uh, and I. Uh, 
you know, odd jobs as a kid. I sold shoes in a store, and uh, I worked in a music store selling guitar picks and you know yeah. that kind of stuff. I never really enjoyed much of any of that yeah. kind of thing, you know. And, and and so once I got a job playing music at age about 20 was the first, I got my first little job, and I've just played ever since. Mm. It's been playing and and teaching. I enjoy teaching. I don't do a lot of it, but I've always done some of it. I taught for almost 20 years at the uh, BIT, Base Institute of Technology in LA. And uh, I left that about two or three years ago. And I teach at uh, a community college in San Diego. Two days a week I do a one and a half hour class. It's a combo class, you know, mm -hmm. where the kids play. And I, I coach them and help. And, and, uh, and then I have three students through the college and I have two or three kind of high school kids that are really good, serious string bass players that I'm really having, and that's my teaching. Yeah, you know, a few hours a week. So, send them up to Central New York. We could use some good acoustic players. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> these kids are into it, and it's really inspiring to me. You know, it uh -huh. gets me like going, oh man, because their enthusiasm is so great mm -hmm. for the music, and to see young people like that serious about the music, mm -hmm. you know. They're carrying the torch, these guys. You know, and there you always hear jazz is dead and this and that. Right. And there's, you know, it's always going to be a, a select and an elite audience, but mm -hmm. just like classical music, but it's not going to ever die. And, the, you know, just seeing these people mm -hmm. confirms that even more in my mind. Yeah. You know? it's, it's really great. Do you see any... Uh, in your area or in, in Los Angeles, is there any kind of racial uh, dividing happening in the jazz world that you witness? I don't see it in San Diego. Uh, we have uh, black and white guys playing around town and a lot of groups where we're together and others where we're not. But I don't ever get, you know, sometimes you get vibes about that from somebody, you know. And, mm -hmm. But I don't sense that around there. You know, uh, it's been so long since I've been in L.A., you know, since 83. Mm -hmm. I never noticed it much around L.A. There, I don't know if it is now more or less, you know. No, there's, seen there seems to be a lot of press about um, books about what about the white guy's contribution to jazz these days and the... Uh, yeah, There's just some stuff floating around, you know, and I just wondered if it got down to. No, you know, I don't. I don't see it. You know, I mean, I've read stuff like that, and yeah. I feel there's bitter people in any kind of race, any place on the planet. You know, and uh -huh. if that's what they want to do, great. It, you know, I mean, you you certainly can't take away from what uh, black artists have done. You know, and, and they certainly have been leaders in many, many, you know, Coltrane and Charlie Parker and Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then but uh, then we've had Bill Evans, and I mean, music is music, and art is art, and it's personal preference to me, you know, and I, I have people I love that are black and white and yellow and green and purple, and and if they're wonderful players and uh, and if they're great people, that makes it really special for me, you know, and that's how I look at it all, you know. San Diego is, is uh, quite the ethnic, or uh, a variety of ethnic. Yeah, we're a border things. town, you yeah. know. We're right there on the, on the edge, 15 miles away from uh -huh. the Mexican border. So we have large Hispanic, large black community. We're getting a big Asian community, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Do you ever feel, um, compelled to try to learn music that, that's coming into the area f from those populations? Well, I've always liked Latin music. I would love, I don't know, you know, I could, if you said, oh, that's a, a merengue or a, I don't know all the technical terms. And I've even played with some Latin guys, you know, in more of kind of a jazz Latin sort of context. And I'll say that to some of them. They say, oh, just play what, you know, how you feel and stuff, you know. And I've, of course, picked up some of the sense of it, and I got to tour South America a couple times with Sarah, which was a great yeah. experience. Uh, Argentina and Brazil and, yeah. you know, all over South America. 
And so I got to hear a lot of it live, some of the real authentic music, uh, the tango in Argentina, which, and the bass players played with the bow down there. Oh. Marvelous. I mean, it was just, and burning, you know, swing and uh -huh. stuff. Uh, so that's always been a, a music that I've loved. Uh, and maybe sometime I'll have the time to really learn more about mm. it, you know. Some uh, of that stuff is really odd to, you, I mean, the bass never seems to fall. Right, like yeah, they play on <laughs> the ands of two and the downs <laughs> yeah. of four. They're not yeah. playing, you know, on the ones and threes like uh, most of our Western music is. So, so it's it's really interesting music, and, and I've learned to feel some of it, you know, from that, that place, and uh, I like it very much. Mm -hmm. What's in the near future for you? Uh, Playing with your grandchildren. Yeah, I'm doing that a lot. I have a, I'm lucky enough to have a steady weekend jazz job. Holly Hoffman, who's a yes. wonderful yeah. flute player, lives in San Diego, yeah. uh, and Mike Wofford, the pianist. And then uh, Jim Plank had been doing it, and he's been, the, we got our symphony back. I don't know if you heard, we, our symphony went oh, belly up. Oh, great news. It's yeah. back functioning. It just started this last year. Uh, so he's been very busy with that, and he does the opera. So we've had an, uh, another drummer, a wonderful drummer, Duncan Moore is his name. And we have this quartet jazz job where we get to play jazz. It's at a Sheraton Hotel in, uh, on Harbor Island in San mm -hmm. Diego. So I have a steady Friday and Saturday. And then I do, uh, there's a nice little winery that opened in Carlsbad, which is the North County. Uh, and we have trio kind of things there without drums for the most part. So. I worked there with Holly and uh, Peter Sprague, the guitarist I mentioned, worked with him. Mundell Lowe, once in a while, will oh. do it. He's living in San Diego. Yeah. So different little things like that, playing around. And uh, I'm going to do Bud Shank's uh, jazz camp in, uh, I think it's in July this summer. Go up and do that. That should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. It's in Port Townsend, up above Seattle, mm -hmm. does that. Uh, Bobby Shoe's coming to town in March, so I'm going to play with Bobby. We're old, old dear friends. I did a lot of recording and played in his group, and we go way back to Las Vegas days. Oh, so wow. I'm really looking forward to seeing Bobby and just kind of various stuff like that, whatever I can get, doing mm -hmm. the teaching and playing around. You, uh, you're a writer at all? A composer? Most of the writing I've done is when they put the gun up to my head, you know. Uh, when I had projects uh, to do, uh, I would write some tunes for those kinds of things. Uh, oh, I actually got, there's a, a record company called Azika Records that Holly's been recording for. And they're talking to me about possibly doing a record, which I, I'm hoping would happen. I, I would like to do one. I didn't for a long time want to do one as, as a leader. but. And I really want to use Joey Barron. I don't know if you know Joey from New York. Uh, piano player? No, Kenny Barron. Oh, Kenny Barron. Piano, piano player. And I want to use Kenny. <laughs> Kenny would be nice. I want to use Kenny. I haven't called Kenny about it, but I talked to Joey a little bit about it, and uh, he's interested. And Peter Sprague, this guitar uh -huh. player, I think can do a quartet thing. So that looks like it might happen. I just, uh, Hal Leonard is publishing a bass book that I've put together. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just got the drafts back from them a couple weeks ago, so I'm looking that over. So that'll be coming out in the near. It's a how to uh, build walking bass lines kind of thing, you know. Just what the world needs. <laughs> Another walking bass line. So, uh, but it was fun. I kind of came up with some angles I thought that were kind of my own over the 30-some 30, yeah. 30 years of playing. So. Right. At f you know, at first I thought, why, you know, why do it? But th there is some validity to it, yeah. I think, you know, so. Oh, I was supposed to ask you a question about your bass. Uh-huh. something nef different about the neck or something? Mm. I don't know, other than it's a very long length. I think that's what it was. It's most, most guys play what's called a three-quarter is the standard size string bass. Uh -huh. And the string length from the nut to the bridge is usually 41 and a half inches to 42 inches right in there. My bass runs 43 and a half inches, so you're dealing with, you know, another inch. Uh -huh. So you have to, of course, spread everything wider wow. and wider and bigger. 
So I rarely sit in on other guys' bases. I'm so used to this great <laughs> thing, thing, you know, everything would be all out of tune. Yeah. So. <laughs> and so consequently, if they tried to play yours, it'd be yeah. pretty nasty, yeah, too. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit. So well, maybe that might be what somebody had mentioned right. about it. I'm constantly amazed at what those string instruments go for these yeah. days. Yeah, they're to completely appreciating all the time. Uh -huh. You know, I bought my bass 30 two years ago for $475. <laughs> and I think it was like 10 years ago I had it appraised and they appraised it at $15,000 then, you know. So, and lots of people are buying them as investments, you know, that aren't mm -hmm. musicians or might just have an interest <laughs> in it and, you know, buying instruments yeah. and keeping them for some time and selling mm -hmm. them for a lot more. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank you for oh, it's coming my up pleasure. after your gig. And yeah, my pleasure to talk to you. I look forward to maybe getting down to San Diego, which seems to be a really nice It's a great town. place to live. I mean, I'm, I'm prejudiced, but I love living there. And yeah. It's been a, and I, I'm an ocean person. I do some surfing and I play tennis, so it's mm -hmm. a great, great place to be right. for that, for those activities. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.